Hey, it's another edition of XI2I. I'm Mike Gibson. I am a designer here at Table XI, and I'm pretty excited. I'm going to be checking in every now and then to tell you all about some tips, tricks, and techniques that uh, we're using here to make better work faster. Today, we're going to be talking about CSS. As a uh, designer, I've been writing CSS for quite some time now. And uh, most days, I spend most of my time writing CSS along with HTML. It's uh, one of the most important tools to what I do. And uh, there's a new tool we come across recently that is actually changing how I write it. Um, but CSS itself has changed quite a bit over time. Uh, let's go back in time here a little bit to actually when I was first starting to work and write websites. Uh, we saw this a lot. We saw the dreaded enter site link. And I mean, I kind of thought this was crazy because we were already on the site. Why do we need to enter it? Aren't we already there? Um, but that's an aside. Uh, if we dug into the code a little bit and started looking at how this link was created and how the colors were added uh, beyond just the typical blue, red, and purple, we would see something like this after digging through loads and loads of tables and nested tables and table cells and way too many T's to even exist in HTML. We would see something like this. We'd see the link tag with attributes on that tag that would have the coloring values in there, the link, the A link, the V link. I didn't even know what V link was when I first saw it, but I saw that other people were doing it, so I just kind of threw in a color. And uh, from there, eventually my links would turn that color and be like, awesome, that does something. Um, but this was a terrible way to write code. Uh, I, I hated this. Um, I don't think many people liked writing uh, their websites like this, but this is what we knew and this is what we could do at the time. So uh, we want to move forward another, I don't know, year, two years or so. And yeah, we still have these enter site links all over the web. I don't know what it was about these title pages that people loved, but uh, I would hover the link and then I noticed this and I, I was very confused. I would look and I was like, where did that underline go? That underline is, is ugly. I would love to get rid of that underline. How did you do this? And I looked at the source code again. That's what we did a lot of. And I saw this weird, weird tag that I'd never seen before. It said style. And I was like, yes, I can get behind this. What are you? Um, and then I looked at the uh, letters inside of it, and I noticed some punctuation that I'd never seen before in websites, and it was all looking really, really weird. But I was instantly in love. I, I did all the research I could do. I dove headfirst into CSS. I had no idea what was going on, um, but I just learned and learned and learned. And it, it legitimately it was the first step uh, the first point in time that completely changed how I wrote websites. And uh, it's cool. I'm still using it nowadays. Uh, we fast forward a little bit, and CSS has definitely grown up from the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, we've had the explosion of CSS3. Uh, we had uh, the uh, web standards movement as well uh, laid the groundwork for all the CSS3 stuff. And uh, now... We have a situation where we can do really, really, really beautiful graphic interfaces uh, solely in CSS. Um, all of this gave rise to a few years after I discovered CSS to the old gradient button. We would have buttons with rounded corners and gradient backgrounds and small shadows. And uh, this was prevalent for quite some time. And in CSS, this was actually quite easy you would just throw your three properties there. You say, this is the color of my type, and this is the radius of my corner, and this is the background image. I want it to be this gradient that the browser is creating. Uh, the reality, though, is that as vendor uh, browser vendors uh, move forward, they moved faster than web standards. So they would implement web standards before they were full standards, and in doing so, they would add what uh, were vendor prefixes. So instead of writing these nice three lines, we would end up with something that looked a little bit more like this. Uh, we would have to declare multiple border radi radiuses. We'd have... <clears throat> like, what is it, five lines here for the gradient. And if you look, there's actually 
two different ways to declare this for WebKit because they did it one way and then they did it another way. And uh, while we were, CSS was becoming far more powerful, these the fact that we had to add all of these vendor prefixes were making our jobs more difficult. We had to keep track of what vendor supported what specs, um, the different syntaxes re related to each of these uh, different specs, and things were getting a little bit crazy. Um, I think that is most uh, easily seen if we look at Flexbox. Um, this is a simple Flexbox layout. We have a container. We want our boxes vertically centered in it, and we want them centered horizontally in the center as well. Uh, this should be easy with Flexbox. You say, hey, this is a flex uh, container. We want to align our items uh, to the center on the center line, and we want to justify our content centered. The reality, though, is that there's actually three different standards and three different specs for Flexbox. Um, we have recently got into a final standard, but there's still browsers out there that support all three standards. So instead of writing these three lines, we have to write these. I'm not even going to count them. There's just way too many lines of code right here, and it is crazy. It is absolutely insane. Uh, no human being should have to write this. Uh, the next big leap in writing CSS actually came from preprocessors, pre though. Things like SAS, uh, SAS and LESS and Stylus, where they allow us to write mix-ins. So instead of writing all 2,000 lines of code like this every time we want to use it, we could write a single mix-in that would say, hey, we're going to call something a flex container. We can tell it which way to align. We can tell it which way to justify and just write out all of these lines of code for us so that every time we want to use it, we just call that mix in. We just say, hey, include flex container and use these values. That made life easier, but we still had to do things like uh, remember what browser supported what uh, version of the spec, remember what vendor prefixes we needed. And we ended up with a lot of CSS files that once they were compiled, had a lot of vendor prefixes in there that we did not need. Our files were bigger than they had to be, and we were wasting uh, brain cycles trying to figure this stuff out. What we really wanted is to just write this. We wanted to write display flex, align our items, justify it, and do that. And uh, we've come across a tool recently uh, that, that I heard about, and I've used it on three projects now that let us do this. It's a tool called Auto Prefixer. It is really cool. You can find out more about Auto Prefixer here at the website. It's github.com slash AI slash Auto Prefixer. And what it does is it looks at your files when you compile them. So we use this as a Rails gem. So when uh, our, our asset pipeline uh, compiles our file, it finds all of our uh, lines of CSS that may need vendor prefixes and then compiles them into the prefixed code based on browser support that we set. So if I write box display flex, it outputs in our compiled code the five lines that we need for Flexbox. Um, if we write border radius for pixels, then it's not going to give us any vendor prefixes because we don't need those anymore. Um, it's really, really cool. Uh, as I mentioned, we're using it with the Rails gem. Uh, you can use it with Grunt. You can use it with Node. Um, it works with Middleman. There's a Middleman gem for it. There's a Sublime Text plugin so that if you just have a plain CSS file and Sublime Text, you can set it so that when you save, it uh, goes through your files and handles your uh, vendor prefixes for you. It works with uh, uh, Compass. It, it, it's, it, there's pretty much not a thing out there that auto prefixer doesn't have some way of supporting. It's really, really cool. Um, how do we use it? Let me show you right here in our gem file. We simply add gem auto prefixer rails. We do our bundle install and installs the gem for us. And then we just set up a config file at uh, config auto prefixer.yaml. And it is as easy as this. We tell it what uh, browsers that we're gonna support it has really simple uh, language to do this. You can give it, like you see right here, we have the last three Chrome versions, last three Safari versions, last three iOS versions. We're doing Firefox 20 and up. Uh, in this uh, case, we're doing Android 3 and up, Internet Explorer 8 and up, and Opera 12 and up. So um, you can support single versions of browsers. So I could literally say, just support Opera 20. 
and nothing else. Um, you can do that. It, it's really, really cool, really, really easy to use. And as a result, we are now just writing standard CSS. We are not writing any vendor prefixes. We're not managing our mix-ins uh, to support render, vendor prefixes. We're simply writing mix-ins to make writing code easier. It is uh, it has been an absolutely amazing change in how we write CSS, and I think everybody out there should be using this tool. Um, I want to thank you for checking in. Uh, I'm going to be back, I don't know, every week, two weeks, three weeks, uh, sometime in there, sharing more tips, tricks, and tools that we are using here in the design department at TableXI. You can find us online at tablexi.com, and our Twitter feed is TableXI. Thanks a lot.